Good afternoon, friends, uh, and welcome uh, to this session uh, where we will be looking at violence, um, trying to understand it. Um, and you will agree with me that um, this is uh, an issue um, which is uh, almost intractable and it seems to defy uh, understanding all the time. We seem to have got a grip on it and it just slips out. Uh, we have uh, two uh, very distinguished speakers with us uh, who have done uh, some amazing work. Uh, to my right is uh, Kalpana Sharma, senior journalist, uh, who has written a lot. Her column, The Other Half, is something that we are all very familiar with. Um, but what we will be discussing today and kind of focusing on is her uh, recent book, uh, The Silence and the Storm, Narratives of Violence Against Women in India. Um, the uh, second speaker uh, to my left, Rahil Dattiwala, uh, is um, somebody who started with journalism, uh, ended as a social scientist, uh, and uh, has uh, written an extremely uh, nuanced and um, interesting uh, account of um, uh, ethnic violence, uh, Hindu-Muslim conflict and structural violence using uh, Gujarat 2002 as uh, the ground on which to base uh, her uh, investigations. Uh, she has a book out which will uh, also be the center of the discussion. It's called Keeping the Peace, Spatial Differences in Hindu-Muslim Violence in Gujarat in 2002. Uh, these are uh, the two books that will be uh, under discussion today, rather the issues that are central to these two books. I will take no more than uh, a couple of minutes to uh, set out uh, the terrain. We, uh, I, I will raise a few issues related to both. I've had the uh, for good fortune to read both the books and we've discussed it briefly as well. After which we will give each of the speakers 10 minutes to uh, speak. And if there are any points that uh, we need to talk about, we may do that brief briefly, but we are hoping that we will be able to open out about 10 minutes uh, to the audience uh, for interaction after uh, both the speakers have spoken. Uh, the, I, I think the central point, these are very different books. Uh, they cover very, I mean, that there are overlaps, for instance, uh, where Rahi looks at uh, what she calls ethnic violence and she makes a distinction between uh, ethnic violence and communal violence. And I think that that for me was a really interesting uh, argument that she puts out where she says that um, Hindu-Muslim violence in contemporary India is what she would call ethnic violence, uh, whereas communal violence is uh, more violence based on caste because the question of nationalism is not as tied to uh, the caste question as it is tied to Hindu-Muslim uh, violence. So she is then speaking primarily of ethnic violence and Hindu-Muslim conflict um, in uh, Gujarat. And as I was reading her work, one of the things that struck me was uh, the methodological question. Uh, you know, uh, being an activist or a journalist or a scholar in the social sciences, how does one study violence? Uh, how, how does one understand it? But more than that, how does one study it? Because in the study of violence, you are looking at survivors, you are looking at a context post-violence, you are looking at participants in violence and speaking to them and you're looking at witnesses. And all of these accounts then uh, are deeply embedded in that particular context of violence. So how do you then uh, uh, attempt to theorize uh, violence uh, within a very embattled situation that is not really in the post phase. So the violence is there, it has happened, the aggravated uh, episodes are behind you, but even in the so-called post phase, post 2002 Gujarat, uh, the violence is just subliminal. It's not as if it has disappeared 
the conflict hasn't disappeared. So in a sense, you are looking at a continuing uh, continuum of violence, and you're trying to examine it from, you know, fr slicing it at one point and trying to examine it backwards and forwards. The, uh, uh, the, the way in which uh, Kalpna builds her narrative is uh, very different because she is looking at uh, the women's movement from the late 1970s. Uh, for instance, from, uh, you know, she calls one of her opening chapters from Mathura to Kathua. So she's looking, it's so, it's so rape and murder of women didn't really start in 2012. And I think that that historicizing of our understanding of sexual violence and campaigns and resistance against sexual violence uh, is something that we need to bear in mind, that we, in fact, have a four-decadal history of resistance, of feminist protest, of legislative reform. And moving from there, within that feminist context, what are the other ways in which we may actually uh, look at the interconnections between, say, sexual violence and other forms of, or expressions of structural violence in which gender is deeply embedded? So uh, what is the relationship between politics and violence? What does a post-violence scenario look like? Uh, how, for instance, are, uh, how, for instance, is uh, the clinical testing of uh, something that is known to, a drug that's known to have harmful effects like the HPV vaccine, uh, how is it then tested on 14,000 girls in a government residential facility where it results in death? Is that violence? Is it not? Uh, is neglect violence? Is it not? Uh, we've been reading a lot about Swachh Bharat and sanitation. In Badayu, we had the case of two young girls who went out and then were raped and murdered. And it was then said that you provide women, you prevent open defecation, you provide women with toilets and they are safe. That sanitation, as Kalpana argues, is a women's issue. But uh, can sexual assault be pegged only onto sanitation? Sexual assault is also deeply structural. So how does one actually understand the spatiality of violence as rooted in the structural, and that's centrally what Rahil tries to address. How do you understand the spatial patterns of violence as intrinsically rooted in the political and uh, as, as uh, you know, social structure, human well, relationships, cognition? Is there anything as uh, such? Is there anything at all like uh, an uh, you know a, a spontaneous or unthinking? participation in violence, because one of the important points Rahil makes is that at any point that violence takes place, the person participating in an episode of violence is never unconscious of the fact that they are actually participating in violence. So the act of violence is something that is part of cognition. You know at every minute that you are doing it that you are in fact being violent and that you intend to be violent. So violence can never be unintentional. Yeah, and this thing of mens rea is something we've constantly, with rape, you know, and we've had our judiciary being complicit in this, saying in the heat of the moment he raped, nobody, not even a husband who's lawfully married to a wife when marital rape is legal in this country, in any heat of any moment, can believe that he has consent when he actually doesn't. He does it knowing that he doesn't have consent. So I think that that relationship between structural violence, the spatial and aggravated instances are something that we have the potential for a very rich conversation about. I'd like to invite Rahil to uh, speak first, and then we will move to Kalpana. Thank you very much, uh, Kalpana, for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much for all of you for attending this talk. I'll make a very key point of the argument first, and I'll go on the aspect of cognition that Kalpana mentioned. Now, I study uh, ethnic riots, I study pogroms, and to some extent, I also study genocides. 
there is a very commonality in uh, the process of violence that at no point in time are there people who can be called frenzied mobs. There are people who are part of the mob who absolutely know what they are doing. They are thinking straight. So the cognition is a very important part. Uh, we may want to believe and we are asked to believe by governments that these were frenzied mobs, that these clashes were spontaneous. When actually when you speak to the people who did the violence, when you speak to the witnesses, you can make out that people who attack know exactly where to attack. They know exactly how to attack. And in the middle of an attack, if they face any kind of risk to their own lives, they can abort the attack. In other words, if anyone says that there is a spontaneous clash or a mob frenzy in place, that uh, does not make a lot of sense. Now, why is this point important? India is one of those democracies where the, uh, which has a very, very bad record of convicting perpetrators of violence. If you look at the anti-Sikh pogrom of 1984, it took almost 30 years to convict the first people. And that also convictions were for looting, not for murder. In Gujarat, uh, the number of convictions were high, but not as high as the number of people who were killed. A very, very um, important reason why this happens is simply because governments have time and again gotten away with this argument. Oh, people were just reacting. It was a clash between angry people who were taking revenge for something. And what could we do? There is a lack of accountability. And there is this convenient blame on faceless mobs. In fact, uh, uh, this book is based on the Gujarat violence. <coughs> and in the beginning, excuse me. The first FIRs filed were omnibus FIRs. What does that mean? 10,000 people attacked. But the victim is naming them. Why aren't you naming them in the police FIRs? No, this was omnibus FIRs. So you cannot pin down anybody who is responsible for the attack. Both the Congress and the BJP have been doing this, uh, taking the foil of spontaneity. Whether it's for the anti-Sikh violence, Rajiv Gandhi very infamously said that when the tree shakes, the ground below it shakes. In other words, I can't do anything about it. Similarly, Narendra Modi has been saying it for everything, for whether it's the vigilante attacks or the Gujarat violence. It was a reaction. So he's made very eclectic references to puppies and uh, Newton laws and all that. Now, um, why, why does this happen? Why are we letting people get away with the killing and mass killing of uh, thousands of people? Uh, sometimes I feel we do not have systematic evidence to show how violence actually works. So there are two levels of violence. There is one level where it is orchestrated. You can, if you can show the mechanisms of how politics actually works top down, that is one level. The second level is the people who actually conduct the violence. Now remember that if there is political ideology at play, not everybody engages in violence. People are not robots. There are people who do not engage in violence. There are people who intend to engage in violence and succeed. And there are a third kind who intend to engage in violence and do not succeed. In other words, there is a very well thought out process going on. And as social scientists, I was hoping in my book to show precisely, I, I may be off the mark, but the attempt was to try and pin down what was the political logic at, at the top. Within this political logic, what happened at the level of the individual and the individual's group? Because always, if there is violence, it is because of people. If there is peace, it's because of people at the ground. So um, let me... Uh, give you a couple of examples. In this book, uh, the first thing uh, we 
I teamed up with a co-author. So this was this is a book based on my thesis at Oxford. So uh, there we I teamed up with the professor and we meticulously collected data for four years on the killings in Gujarat using as far as possible objective uh, sources. And we found that the killings were worst where the BJP faced the greatest competition. The killings were very less where the BJP was very strong or where it was very weak. Now this is interesting because let's say if it was an argument of spontaneity, if people spontaneously went into and killed, you should expect more people coming out and killing in places where the BJP was strong because that means they had more supporters there. But this was not the case. But despite this political ideology, there were people on the ground. You had neighborhoods which faced very different levels of violence even within one constituency. So the, while the political party wanted to win votes in the next election, and they did, this is what we, sh that what we show in this book, there were neighborhoods in constituencies that had different levels of violence. So was it a matter of chance? Was it coincidence? I argue that it was not a coincidence. Let me give you an example. So I think many people must have heard of uh, Noroda Patia. It was a neighborhood in Ahmedabad. Just a, you know, ordinary slum neighborhood of Hindus and Muslims. It became infamous in 2002 because in one single day within a matter of hours, 97 Muslims were killed. Now, when I went there during my studying the neighborhoods, I found that this road had Hindu Muslims in Naroda Patia and there was another road where Hindus and Muslims of Naroda Patia lived. All 97 were killed here, nothing happened here. So that, that's, a, uh, that's a sociological puzzle. Why? Why were people, did, were they attacked or were they not attacked? If they were not attacked, why not? Over time it came when I spoke to the people who actually committed those murders. When I spoke to the witnesses, they said that they could not attack here simply because the geographical space was such. It was a very simple explanation. In other words, what I'm trying to tell here is that the cognition was there. In the middle of the attack, the attackers changed track. They moved course and went to a very different went just across the road, where the roads were such that the attackers could escape very easily. So no attacker attacks without wanting to injure, in the knowledge that I can be injured. So there is a very rational motivation for attacking and therefore, if we can find such evidence to pin down people who have committed these attacks. Again, remember that most of these attackers were neighbors. Anybody who was saying that these were outsiders was simply saying this because they know they were neighbors who will never be convicted and they will have to come and live with them, next to them. Because they were neighbors, it made sense that they would attack places around them. So the aspect of cognition was very important. Um, and the bottom line is simply that one has to be skeptical of any arguments that governments give that this was a, these were spontaneous clashes between people that we have nothing to do with it. There has to be a skeptic, skeptic's view about this sort of an argument because at the end of the day, these are people who know what they are doing and finally, I'll make a point about neighborhoods which did not engage in violence, which were peaceful. So I happened to study two neighborhoods which have become very famous. They, um, one of them is, has a very nice name also. It is called Ram Rahim Nagar. Very famous. Many people have been there, visited it. It has the reputation of keeping peace for 40 years. Ahmedabad, this is in Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad is known for, notorious for violence. And yet it kept peace. So the first intuition was, people must have very good relations with each other. Otherwise, how do you keep peace? But that was not the case. In fact, there was a lot of hostility between the Hindus and Muslims in these neighborhoods. And yet, 
for a variety of strategic reasons, they could keep peace, not only in 2002, in 92, in 85. These were major riots in Ahmedabad. So finally, the whole idea is that whether you keep peace or violence, people can act on what they want to do. It is possible. Even if there is inter-ethnic hostility, it does not mean that you cannot be peaceful. There are ways and there are motivations to do it. This may look like an argument antithetical to diversity, but it's not. It's basically showing you that we are the agents eventually. So even when the worst violence happens because of political ideology, one can keep peace. And um, I think that is the key uh, argument. And I wish that similar studies which are systematically, if we can show in anti-Sikh pogroms, there would have been much more evidence to pin down uh, perpetrators. Have I gone over time? OK, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Rahil. I think that that, that uh, you know, particularly in uh, the situation uh, that we find ourselves today, this uh, you know this this argument that it you know the the keeping of peace is something that is completely in our control, uh, and what it needs is uh, a shared understanding on the importance and the inescapability of keeping uh, the peace is something that, uh, you know, is a very useful and productive idea to work with. Uh, I will now uh, request Kalpana. Hey, uh, thank you. And thank you. H. Excuse my voice. This is not my natural voice. I know some people think it sounds more interesting than my natural one. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so, I mean, Rahil and my book is very different, but uh, as Kalpana said, there are commonalities. So I'm a journalist. I'm not an academic. Um, I've been a journalist now for 48 years. And much of that time, I consciously chose to focus on gender, uh, not just write a column, but to actually look at <clears throat> contemporary developments and development policy, economic policy, environmental policy, wearing a gendered lens to see how it impacts uh, one half of the population. and. Um, in the course of that, I myself began to understand much more about how this works on the ground. So <clears throat> when some people said, you know, because you've been writing about it for so long, why don't you think about putting together a book? By the way, writing a book for a journalist is a pain. Much nicer to write an article than to write a book. So, but anyway, it forced me to read back. And I tried to think, what is the one thread that runs through? In, the, in what I've written since the 80s till today. <clears throat> and I realized that the common thread is this, how we look at violence. So that's why I've called it the silence and the storm narratives of violence against women. Uh, because in the 80s, uh, it was very similar to what we saw in 2012. Uh, in the 80s, it was a, a tribal woman called Mathura who was raped in a police station <clears throat> in Maharashtra. And as a result of that, the autonomous women's movements uh, came out and demanded changes in the law, in the rape law. And those important changes were made in the mid-80s, much of which people have forgotten now. So it's, it's as if for the first time people demanded it in 2012. So I began to see that you have to understand why at particular moments in time certain <clears throat> uh, incidents of violence get picked up and amplified to the point that it puts pressure on the government to look at the law. So in, 19, uh, in the early 80s and the late 70s, when the Mathura rape case took place, and also in this city of Hyderabad, the Ramiza B case, there was no electronic media. There was only print. Um, so to amplify your um, uh, objection to something, you had to come out on the streets. It's very ironic to me that today the same thing is happening despite the fact that technology has changed the manner in which information travels. And it's just the sheer numbers of people demanding change. And it was a cross-section. It was not just women. There were solidarities built with trade unions, with human rights, with others who came out to demand that change. 
In 2012, I think the main difference was the nature of the media <clears throat> and the fact that the media could amplify it to a national level, which also led to the pressure on the government uh, to bring about the change. But the story is much the same. You know, it may have been a custodial violence case in the case in 1985, and in 2012, it was a horrendous uh, gang rape. <clears throat> but when I say the story is the same, what I mean is that a woman goes to a police station expecting that that's a place where you are safe, right, protected, and instead she gets raped. A young woman in Delhi in this age goes out to see a movie with a friend, waits at a bus stop, gets into a bus. It's not a place you would expect that you're going to get raped, and she does. So, therefore, what is it? What, what is happening in our society that regardless of whether it's a safe place or an unsafe place, and that also is a very troubling uh, definition that keeps coming up every now and then, <clears throat> that women are still the target of this kind of sexual assault and the most brutal type. But the other thing to understand is, whereas the one or two cases get amplified and talked about and recorded and lead to some change, these represent just a sliver of the actual violence that takes place that women suffer. And crime statistics have established over time that over 90% of the sexual assaults on women actually take place in the so-called safe places, which are their homes, their neighborhoods, by men they know. But you never get us coming out on the streets demanding, for instance, that marital rape should be made into a crime. So that is an interesting thing to think about, that why is it <clears throat> uh, that this happens? And my, uh, my uh, concern about that, and I say it as a media person, is because we tend to go uh, full blast on some of these cases, is that our society's understanding of what constitutes violence against women gets warped. So it's as if the only violence women are experiencing is out there in the public space, yeah? when the majority is actually within. The other thing is that the only cases that get highlighted are often those that happen in our metro cities. So that one, 2012, was in Delhi. Recently, you had one here in Cyberabad. Um, whereas, again, the majority of cases of violence are actually away from the metros uh, and on women who are anyway marginalized whose voices will never be heard, you know, like the Dalits, like the tribals, and in places of conflict like the Northeast, like Kashmir. But we don't hear about these. <clears throat> Occasionally, Katwa comes up or something comes up, but the fact that, you know, women had to strip, old women had to strip in Manipur uh, in order to get people to understand what the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is doing to Manipuri women after uh, Manorama's rape and murder is something I don't think impinges on us, you know. What does it do for an older woman, Anima, to get out there and actually strip in front of Kangla Fort? So, <clears throat> the process of writing this has made me think about the, these threads of violence. And as I said, for me, uh, in order to come up with solutions of how we handle the issue of violence against women, we do have to understand it in its entirety, rather than in this way in which the focus remains on only a few chosen uh, cases. The automatic response to this kind of noise made about a few cases is to demand stronger laws. We know that. That's happened earlier. It's happened again. And <clears throat> even the strongest laws don't seem to be enough. You know, the death penalty was introduced by the government in 2013 despite the fact that the committee that it, the government itself appointed, the Varma committee, argued strongly against the introduction of the death penalty. And now we are sitting days away from maybe those four men who uh, may uh, have to uh, go to the gallows. Uh, but the thing is, these are one or two cases that have reached that point. What happens to the thousands and thousands of cases, and why are we not discussing the criminal justice system. That is the demand that should be made about how do we make our criminal justice system, which is truly broken in terms of how it functions for the poorest and the most marginalized, including women. And that doesn't get into the discussion about violence, you know. It's, it's uh, we talk about only 
as I said, the celebrated cases. And um, the other thing I, I want to say is, uh, am I running out of time? Hmm. So, so sexual violence, as I said, we have to understand in these larger, uh, in the larger framework. But I've argued for a long time, partly because uh, the subjects that I write on have been developmental issues and environmental issues, that government policy on these areas also actually result in a kind of violence, especially on women and the most marginalized, which we don't recognize as violence. And there are many instances. And you know, like displacement, we can talk about displacement. Of course, it affects everybody. But the person who has to carry the burden of that displacement is often the woman, who in any case is already burdened with the additional work that she has to do. This is not factored in. <clears throat> Take sanitation, uh, which I've talked about at length. Just last week, there was a case which to me illustrat illustrated how little has changed. In Bombay, there's a place called Kurla, which is not a very distant suburb. Uh, a, a widow was on her way back to her home, home place. So she went a little early because her long distance train from Kurla was going to leave at midnight. So she went at 10 o'clock at night. And walking to the station, she went into the bushes to urinate. Huh? This is in Bombay. Open defecation, we keep hearing it's ended, yeah. She went under, uh, behind some bushes to uh, urinate, and two men pounced on her and raped her. They stole all her belongings, including her Mangal Sutra. And then before she could recover, two more men came and pounced on her and, and left her alone. Luckily, another woman saw what had happened and came and helped this woman go to the station and register a case. Now, when I go back to Bombay and read the papers, I am 100% sure there's been no follow-up on this. This is a story that will be forgotten. But it illustrates for me exactly this thing, that <clears throat> you build infrastructure, but you don't think you know, how poor women in a rich city are still vulnerable because there's something like a toilet, which is not easily accessible at a railway station. You know, to me, it's, it's horrific that in 2020, we should even have to register something like this. So the, there are many illustrations like this in developmental and environment policy, which I've written about and which I've recorded. But I believe in our understanding of uh, violence against women, we must factor this in, because this is the larger uh, basis on which uh, violence continues to be perpetuated on women. Um, thank you, uh, Kalpana. I think uh, one of the, um, you know, there's so many uh, issues that Kalpana actually threads together uh, in the book, but I think that the one, one really important uh, point that you raised was about the criminal justice system. Uh, after the Nirbhaya case and the enactment of the Nirbhaya Act, uh, the whole idea was that uh, we had a, a very flawed uh, criminal protections for women against rape and we need a more stringent law. So you got a stringent law, although women's groups at that time were unanimous and like she said, Justice Verma in fact observed that the death penalty is not advisable, the death penalty is put into the rape law and yet you have an incident uh, in Hyderabad where there has been a most horrific rape and nothing can actually take away from the horror of the rape of the veterinarian. But what happens after that is just as horrific, if not more, that is that four suspects are apprehended and shot dead like dogs. And nobody, nobody seemed at that point who was in the public seemed to think that there was anything wrong about this. And the term that was being used was encounter. It was not an encounter. It was a custodial killing. These were four men who were in the custody, in the legal custody of the police, and they were shot in the legal custody of the police, for which the police commissioner got showered with rose petals. So when Rahil says, for instance, that when we witness or participate in violence, please let us be very conscious that cognition plays a very important role. There is no unconscious moment, either in witnessing or participating, and in celebrating the custodial killing of four suspects who had not gone through trial, who had not been convicted. The death penalty is a very We are talking here of just the apprehension of suspects. Uh, 
and being killed like that. And I think that just the fact of trying to get a repostmortem for them, getting that done, uh, for me personally earned me a lot of hate mail. I had males which asked me, you know, told me that so-and-so man is ashamed to call me a woman. So I said, but I don't even want you to call me anything. But you know, you got males like this. You're, you, you don't befit the description of a woman. You don't befit the description of a professor. Why? Because you say nobody can be apprehended and shot. So you have the criminal justice system weighted in that way on one side. On the other side, you have somebody like Devinder Singh actually doing something that you would think is inconceivable after baying for Afzal Guru's blood. You then find that Devinder Singh is actually going with Hijbul militants, and there is such a fuzzy silence about that. Have you seen anybody baying for Devinder Singh's blood? Did we see anybody baying for Kuldeep Sengar's blood? Did we see anybody baying for Nityananda's blood? No. You know, so this whole thing of structural violence, our complicity, and the way in which in the ways in which we witness, we in fact perpetuate this violence is really something that uh, I think uh, comes through, in fact, with both the narratives, with, you know, j just that we need to be self-conscious about the way in which we understand it and the stories of violence that we hear relate back to us, as well as in our understanding of what are the processes and the legal strategies and the movement strategies that we take, you know, to move ahead. With this, I open it out for a couple of questions. If anyone from the audience would like to make a brief question or a brief comment. Comment. Yeah, you and then you. Yeah. Uh, so my question is that, don't you think that the media takes a very negative advantage of the aspects that make these cases of violence and sexual assault very gruesome from the time that we see that there have been copycat crimes happening from 2012 at a very large scale? There was just assault before, and now there's assault and then a murder, immediately. So don't you think that the media is taking over advantage and spreading propaganda, uh, propaganda and uh, you know fake news all over again and again? And what kind of positive change can we bring through media? What kind of hope can we bring through the media to the public? to, you know, make things, make people aware of what exactly is happening in the society, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Not much. Why don't we take the questions and then we'll just yeah. give you time. Ma'am, I'm uh, glad that you brought uh, Afzal Guru and Singer uh, thing because my question is related to both and I want both the uh, speakers to please uh, talk about it, about uh, the uh, state politics and uh, quote unquote uh, independent judiciary nexus because state is not one entity all the apparatus uh, which the government is using is part of state and every uh, uh, institution of that uh, of the state is uh, morally corrupt uh, about that if you can talk I, uh, my question is about um, so the cases that get uh, a lot of mileage in the news are typically the ones where a murder follows the rape. But uh, when we talk about structural issues, one of the biggest issues uh, is, of course, what happens to the survivors. Mostly medical response, police response, <coughs> and what happens over and over again. And I'm glad the issue of fake news and media has come up, because I'm a journalist myself, and we also, one of the spaces we work in is um, policy data and also debunking fake news. So um, as journalists, what is the real uh, change that we can make, is my question. We take one more question and then give the... So uh, my question is, um, uh, you were talking about collective violence, right? Uh, frenzied mobs. What is the phenomena in the last five years that we are seeing an upsurge in individual acts of violence in the form of lynchings? Like, I'd really like you to, you know, if you could just analyze that and, and let, just let me know your thoughts, because what does that have to do with? I mean, people are putting up Facebook pictures, images of them burning people alive, is this a, some sort of narcissism? I mean, this is removed from the collective, whatever, mob, frenzied violence that uh, you know, we saw in the Gujarat riots and, and the anti-Sikh riots. So what do you say to that? Um, and uh, this is a question to both of you. Um, India is seeing an unparalleled rise in violence in social media. 
what are your comments on it? How do we activists, journalists, uh, um, uh, academics, uh, you know, uh, good humans in India, how do we handle that? So, I mean, we spoke about all forms of violence, violence against women, political violence, communal violence. What about the biggest threat to India, which is in the form of violence in social media? So, I believe you are talking of the vigilante violence that has gone on. It still remains, it, you know, it's, I, I believe it's, it still is a collective form of violence. You are a collective form of violence simply that you are engaging in group violence against a victim. It's easier to pass it off as spontaneous in this case then I would argue that it's not. So it, it, it's easier to pass off spontaneous because, well, uh, in uh, uh, an event of uh, ethnic riots, you can, at <laughs> you can pin down, you can get data on elections and you can say, oh, perhaps this was politically beneficial. Here, we are a functional democracy. How do you, within a functional democracy, conduct implicit forms of censorship of violence against minority groups, give it a flavor of spontaneity. I would look at it, you call it righteous anger. Oh, they were justified because, well, after all, they broke the law. So you, you hurt the victim and you blame the victim. It happens in rape also. So there's a saying by, I think it was Seneca who said, those who offend, cannot forgive. I think within a functional democracy, how else would you run? Because we are not called a liberal democracy, we are called an electoral democracy. It's a difference there. So I have not studied vigilantism in detail, but I would, this is what my perception is. And with regard to social media, quickly I would say that I believe it's a, it's a forum of non-experts and it's creating public opinion. There was a time when public opinion was created by, well, I wouldn't say so-called so -called experts, but there were people who would know what they're talking about. Perhaps now it's not, and there is a chain. So it's the same interaction chain that goes on on the ground when violence occurs. The same thing goes on when social media, it's a, the interactive chain that creates gossip. So I would perhaps look at it like that. Uh, Kalpana? <clears throat> Let me address the question about the media. So, <clears throat> and I think all of us have to understand what is the media today, okay? So it's, it's pure commerce, okay? And crime sells. The more prurient it is, the more it sells. If the crime is something that affects people like us and we are the market of that media, then those are the crimes that will find space. There are newspapers now that have up to 20 news, uh, journal, uh, reporters covering crime. You know, in my day when I joined a newspaper, the lowest beat was the crime beat. But not anymore because of this, because commerce dictates what the media covers and not the principle of what has happened. And therefore you find <clears throat> that anything that will get them eyeballs, whether if it's a television channel or if it's a newspaper, get them readers, are the stories that are stretched out to the point that they even violate the law that we're not supposed to reveal the name of survivor. So I've given the instance, for instance, in Bombay, six months after what happened in Delhi, there was a photojournalist who went on a shoot to the Shakti Mills, which is an abandoned textile mill right in the middle of Bombay, and she got gang raped. Now, because she was a journalist, and she managed to get through to her team and they all rallied around. She went to a hospital, got the crime registered, got herself tested, got the crime registered, etc. But it happened in Bombay, you know, and the, this is a journalist, the word got out. <clears throat> it was a big story for the Bombay papers to the point where one newspaper sent a journalist to the colony where she lived and asked the watchman, do you know where that girl is who got raped? The watchman did not know that a girl lived in that building who had been raped. So they actually outed uh, the survivor to the community where she lived. Another journalist carried, uh, climbed 16 floors to Jaslok Hospital to try and get into the room of this 
woman to interview her. For what? So this is the trouble. I mean, this is what the media does. And when I say distorts, it's not telling the full story. It's telling the stories that will self. And so I don't know about copycat crimes. The, the result of this kind of reporting, and uh, may not be exaggeration, but as I said, playing up, is actually it hits back at women in the end. Because as you know, after 2012, one of the narratives was, oh, no place is safe for women. And that is better they stay at home, and especially young women, constantly told how you dress, don't go out, don't take taxis alone. In fact, the speaker of, of this state, when it was United Andhra, had said, women are like parked cars, better to keep them parked at home. Then there, no accident will take place. You know, I mean, so, and I'm giving you these instances because this is what the media is creating this buzz, but the basic issue of that a politician can make this kind of remark, and there are many remarks, we can do a whole book on what politicians say when these things happen, also illustrates, illustrates to us that our mindsets have not changed at all in this country. Whatever technology we might have, it's still the same. Male entitlement is still the same. Women who transgress in any way, or who are seen to be the other, are then open to any kind of violence, you know, apart from your own women, so to speak, who have to sit, sit back and experience daily violence. Women out there are targeted. And so I agree with Rahil that this thing of spontaneous and <coughs> has, has no uh, meaning at all when it comes to sexual violence either. Uh, the other day I heard somebody saying men have to learn anger management, you know. So anger management, you know, really? <laughs> Is that what leads to assaults on women? 